just to be aware of everyone's time, we are going to go ahead and get started with our kind of workshop today. So one of the things we often hear from people is there's a lot of confusion um, out there when you're looking at trying to protect the idea that your business has created. So we put together a series of three workshops just to provide an overview, some guidance, um, some best practices, and really those first and crucial uh, critical steps on moving forward with protecting your idea. What do you need to know about the process? Um, what are some of the timelines you're looking at? Areas like that. So in this first session, we're actually going to do an overview about patents. So what is a patent? What is the purpose of a patent? What does a patent do? What doesn't it do? Um, going through how do you actually start this process, which is going to involve the USPTO or the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And then just a really quick discussion on why is it so vital for businesses to protect their idea and the intellectual property they're creating? And we're actually going to have a, let's call it a presentation, um, but Brooke Montgomery, who owns a small business that has secured a, a couple of patents, is going to talk about why she looked at protecting her idea and the process that she went through for that. But just to kind of really quickly get started here. So <clears throat> what actually is a patent? Well, at the heart of it, a patent is a way for you to protect what you have created. In the United States, this can depend on the type of patent, but it's a good idea to plan that when you secure a patent, you're protecting a process, a design, or an invention for a period of 20 years. Now, if you are looking at protecting your idea outside of the United States, there are foreign filings, you can definitely do that, but each country that you want to file in has its own rules, restrictions, regulations, process. For instance, if you want to protect your idea and you're selling in somewhere like Mexico, you will actually reach out to the Mexican patenting um, office and move through that process. Um, similar if you wanted to try and protect your idea in Japan or Norway or a lot of different countries each country that you are looking at for protecting your idea, they will have their own process that you have to go through. So that's kind of one of the things to think about when you're looking at how do I protect this? What are the most critical protections? Because there's going to be a cost associated with each country as well. When you're looking at a patent, one of the things to keep in mind is a patent really is something novel something that's unique, something that's different, something that's revolutionary, but it really just can't be non-obvious. And yes, that is guidance from the PTO. And like most governmental things, there's not really a good, let's call it definition for either novelty or non-obvious. They have their kind of ideas about what novel is, they have their guidance about what non-obvious is, but if you tied up a patent examiner to a chair and held a gun to his head, they could not give you a definitive definition. But when you're looking at novelty, one of the things to think about there is it has to really be different than anything that's come before it. So people, when they're looking at protecting their entire catalog, sometimes they go, well, you know, I have this thing, it's a little bit different. I have this thing that's radically different. I have this thing that's just an offshoot of the previous thing. And a lot of times those aren't going to be an entirely new patent if it's just an offshoot. It'll be something like a continuation in part, which we'll get to here shortly. But it really just can't be recognizable. You can't look at it and go, well, yeah, you obviously created that from something else that was already out there. That's not going to be patentable. Now, it can 
much get a little bit murky there when it's a new discovery based off of something that's already out there. Again, that's when you're going to look at other vehicles like, you know, continuation and parts. And then the second one, we're actually going to go through all of the different types of patents, all of the different kind of continuations on protections that you can go through. But it's just something that would be surprising if you handed this to an expert and they went, oh, wow, I didn't think you could ever do that. Or, huh, that's really interesting. I didn't know that the science would actually work that way. That's what you need to focus on when you're thinking about, do I match the criteria for novel and non-obvious? And when you're thinking about patents, one of the things that a lot of people get wrong is they go, well, a patent protects me. And it does protect you, but in the sense that it's not a guaranteed right to stop things like infringement. If you believe that someone created something infringing upon your patent, you're going to have to go through the proper judiciary channels and essentially sue them. Now, when you go through that system, it is up for, or when you go through that process, it's up for the judicial system to decide, is this a valid claim of infringement? Can you definitively say, yes, this person created something that is infringing? This person created something that I've already proven, that I hold the rights on, that they pretty much just copied and pasted word for word from what I did. That's why it's not really a guaranteed right. It's a mechanism to stop infringement. It's a mechanism to protect yourself, but there are active things that have to be done for that mechanism to be activated. Now, what can be patented? There's a big laundry list of things that could actually be patented. But when you break it down to it, it's like when you were a kid and you played 20 questions. And you know, if you were good at 20 questions, pretty much the first question you ask is, is it an animal, vegetable, or mineral? Kind of really similar idea here. You can patent things like new plants, um, new devices, new materials, new designs. And the weird thing about the design patents is they're ornamental, not functional. Um, if it's functional, well, that's a utility patent, not a design patent. It's going to be a lot of those kind of weird asides as we move through the information over the next you know, three sessions here. The one area that it gets very tricky on, though, is when you are trying to patent software. So software is one of the things that a lot of times will be relegated to copyright rather than patent because there's a list of criteria for patents and there's a list of criteria for copyrights that can make one a lot more difficult than the others. So that's why a lot of times you'll find software that isn't patented, it's copyrighted. Now the algorithm that drives the software, that essentially can be patented, but software itself gets kind of sticky because it has to be useful. There has to be a purpose for what you're patenting, and it has to be operational or operational or demonstrable. You have to be able to show that this isn't just theory. This isn't something I just, you know, cooked up in my garage and thought it would be cool. There, you have to show that the science says it works every time. This is how it works. This is the, you know, essentially scientific proof that it's based on. Because when you go through a patent, you're going to have to make claims. You're going to have to claim that this works this way, this works this way, this works this way. Because when you do a patent, that's actually what you're protecting. You're protecting the claims. Now, you want to make sure claims are pretty broad when you're looking at that. And next session, we'll have a former USPTO examiner that's going to give some tips on looking at those claims. How do you put those claims into action? And what are the claims that you really need to kind of validate and verify before you go through this process? You can't really just say, well, you know, this is a really great idea, but I don't know how it works and I don't know what it's going to do. 
but it's cool, right? Yeah, I mean, research-wise, it is novel and interesting. Patentability-wise, going to be a swing and a mess. So that's what can be patented. So what can't be patented? Well, the list isn't exhaustive. And again, there's very little definitive definitions on what can't be patented. But it's a good kind of checklist here. So if it is something that you have disclosed publicly, and it's been over a year since you disclosed it publicly, it can't be patented. After a year, it has kind of been put into the general public mindset, it becomes public information at that point. And you can't protect public information. You can only protect private information. You also can't patent medical methods. And this, like everything else, gets a little bit murky. But if it's something that's going to save millions of lives, it's a, if it's a medical method itself, you actually can't patent that. Now you can patent the devices or the products that are practicing those methods, but you can't just patent the overall application of those methods. Really great example here is insulin. So there are patents for insulin. Now they have patented the device for practicing that method, but the method of providing you know, a glucose stimulant to somebody that is in a diabetic critical event, you can't patent that itself. You can patent the drug that, you know, drives that, but the actual application of that is not patentable because it is public benefit, public health. Anything that is large public benefit like that cannot be protected. Another thing that you cannot patent are mathematical equations are laws of nature. So anything that would be fundamental knowledge about our understanding of science, um, you know, understanding the fabric or the rules of the universe that drives us, that cannot be patented. Now, again, this gets into the weird area where you can patent the things that apply it or the things that practice it, but you cannot patent. If you make a new scientific discovery, a scientific theory, that turns into a scientific rule. Uh, you can't patent that theory or rule. You can patent the thing that you know is derived from that, the thing that drives that, or the thing that applies that. But when it comes to the overall fundamental knowledge, that cannot be patented. And the reason that I said, you know, in the last slide, that software is a bit of a sticky issue. One of the other things is you can't patent abstract ideas. So this seems like it might be something that just kind of falls into the previous bullet, but really it's things that are just ideas that are out there and they're not demonstrable. So again, if you have something that is just this really great idea, this thing that you can't really nail down, that you can't point towards, then you can't patent it. And that's where a lot of rejections on software will come from is the software itself can be seen a lot of times as an abstract idea. It's not really the vehicle that's driving the thing. So it gets very weird when you're patenting software. That's why a really great best, uh, best practice there is just look at copyrights um, for things like software and those other means of protection um, that you can effectively enforce because sometimes you're fighting an uphill battle if you try to protect software. But speaking of copyrights, so a lot of times people might confuse patents with copyrights or trademarks, but they are not equal. Um, each one of them has a very particular use. You know, patents are things that are useful, non-obvious, not abstract, very concrete and definitive. Now, copyrights, though, are artistic expressions. Um, copyrights are for things that you've kind of authored when you think about it. And, you know, what do we mean by authoring? Well, it's really you've created it. 
when you look at copyrights, a lot of times it's when you're writing a, you know, a new story or you've put a new score to music or it's a new artistic expression or an artistic work. That is copyright. Um, that kind of also gets into the weird thing about software because sometimes it's more of an artistic work. Um, that's the work itself isn't demonstrable, the thing that's driving it is. And yes, a lot of times people say, well, I don't need to copyright this. There's automatic protection. And that is true. There is automatic protection when you copyright something. But if you have to ever action on that, if you have to ever bring a case forward for infringement of your copyright, then you have to actually have rigorous protections. You have to have filed for that copyright protection before you can action upon a potential infringer. And kind of along those same lines, you have trademarks. Now, trademarks are something that's very definitive when it comes to the patent world. A lot of times trademarks are really just the words, their symbols, their names. They're a thing that defines people's understanding or identification of a product or a service. So why do you need to know the difference between these three? Well, they can really act hand in hand. So when you're looking at you know, the example of software, so you patent what the software actually does, you copyright the source code for the software, and then you trademark the software name because that's the thing that everybody's gonna say, hey, I need to get Microsoft Word. Well, Microsoft Word is trademarked. Now, the actual code base behind it is copyrighted. And, but what it does is kind of one of those fundamental knowledge points. It's helping people write. So you can't really patent it, but you can copyright and you can trademark it. And each one of these gives you a different level of protection and a different way to enforce that protection. So it's very critical to knowing the difference between those three when you're looking at putting together your plan for seeking protections on your ideas and what is derived from those ideas in the future. Now, there is kind of a monolithic system that everybody should be aware of when they're even thinking about patenting something. And that's the USPTO. So in the United States, the Patent and Trademark Office handles all requests for trademarks, copyrights, and patents. But before you even think about USPTO, you have to come up with a game plan. Why am I gonna do this? What am I gonna do? How am I gonna go through this process? And when you're looking at protecting your idea, it's a great idea or a great first step to know the difference between the types of protections that not only exist between like patenting, trademarking, and copywriting, but even within patenting. So for patenting, you'll probably have heard the terms provisional or non-provisional. Now, a provisional filing is not really a protection. Actually, when you file a provisional patent, you file the application and they don't prosecute those claims or examine. USPTO uses the term prosecution when they're examining things. Don't ask me why, but that's what they do. And because of that, as soon as you file that application, you're technically in a patent pending status. Now, what that does is, again, it doesn't give you definitive protections, but it puts you kind of at the head of the line. You have the first right to file once you have that provisional in place, as long as there's not another provisional that's already out there or a patent. Remember, non-obvious and unique. And when you file a provisional, because it is just that first right to file, you don't really get to you know, sit on it and go, 
hey, this is something that might be useful in the future. I'm just going to go ahead and file a provisional and I'll get back to this in a couple of years. You have one year to file protections and those full protections. So that non-provisional after you have um, secured that uh, provisional. And remember, it is secured as soon as you click the application button. And a lot of people sometimes go, well, then what's the point of going through a provisional? I can you know, just go through the utility. There is some business sense though in filing for a provisional because it gives you some amount of protections in place while you are moving the science forward, while you're trying to validate some claims, while you're trying to verify that, yes, science says this happens this way. I can prove this, I can demonstrate this. And it also allows you to start discussing your invention. If you don't have anything in place and you start publicly talking about your invention, well, one, that kicks off the public disclosure time period. But two, if you don't have any sort of protections in place and you're telling people how it works, then they can actually go out there and they can patent it themselves. If you are working with people that are unscrupulous, they can take that information you gave them, they can file a provisional, and then that gives them the first right to file. So that's why it's a really great idea that if you are going forward with protecting your ideas, trying to protect the intellectual property that your company is creating, you might wanna go through a provisional first. And it also gives you a great timeline to work from. Now, now I know people are busy, you know, that work-life balance, things happen in the business, you have to you know, transition, you have to move, but knowing that you have a year to get this in, otherwise it expires, that gives you a definitive goal and a definitive timeline. You know exactly what you have to do, you know how, when you have to get it together, you know when you have to get it in, otherwise you lose the ability to ever protect this in the future. And it's just that level of accountability for being able to, at the end of the day, move the goalposts forward for your business. So now that we've talked about all that kind of in depth and probably bored everybody to tears, what do you actually do to file it? Well, again, in the next session, we're gonna dive into this very in depth between the different types of patents, but really just as an overview, one of the things to keep in mind when you're looking at filing a patent is patents are very data driven. And what I mean behind that is, remember, they have to be demonstrable. You have to show the science, you have to show how it works, you have to show why it works, you have to show that it works every time in that same exact way. And that's why they're data driven. You have to have those metrics. You have to have that information. You have to have that knowledge when you're making your claims on what your technology or what your idea actually does and being able to expand on it from there. As you're even going through conceiving the idea, you know, testing it out or making it work, you really want to keep meticulous notes throughout that entire process because all of that information is going to go into your patent application. If you don't have that information and you apply for a patent, more than likely it's going to get rejected and it's going to get rejected in a way that you can't come back and have a you know quote unquote argument with the examiner and say no you didn't understand this or oh well I had data here that I just didn't include. When you do a utility application or any type of full um, non-provisional application, you can't add additional things afterwards. If it's going to be a piece of information that is going to validate a claim, most of the time without you know, bending the absolute rules and the authority that the USPTO has, it has to be within that application. It has to be that supporting information. It has to be that diagram that shows how these different components come together and drive this wonderful idea that you've created. It's one of those things that 
you just really have to have that understanding, that knowledge, and you just really have to have it almost down in, you know, stone that I know this, this is why it works, this is how it works, and this is the stuff that I'm going to need when I submit this application. Now, again, the filing body in the United States is the USPTO. And they're not just the filing body, they're also a really great kind of data and information warehouse because they keep a database on all the existing or published patent applications um, across, you know, essentially time. So when you're looking at your strategy for doing your protections, one of the first things that you'll actually want to do is go through that database, start actually looking at, and use some really good keywords. It's not the smartest system in the world. It's a government system. Sometimes you have to be very direct when you search through it, but you can see what's out there that's similar. Who else has had ideas about thermonuclear dynamics or whatever you're trying to protect? Who else has created something that I can point towards and say, they got this wrong, or no, my thing does this that's completely different. You have to be able to know what is that novelty and anything else that could seem contradictory information. Because one of the first steps that the USPTO is gonna do when they go to examine is they're actually going to do that search. If you haven't disclosed anything, then they're going to approach your application with the idea in their head that, well, they didn't do their due diligence. They don't look at the stuff. They aren't sure what's out there. How do we know that this is something that's novel? It might make them you know, take a much finer tooth comb to your application than is really warranted. So when you're doing that search, when you're trying to make that known, when you're looking at everything out there that could be contradictory or, you know, might be that uphill battle to getting your protections in place, know what's out there, know how you're different, and know exactly why you're different. Again, it's going to be very key in your application. And now, when you're coming up with a game plan, you can never overlook cost. You know, that's really one big part of scope for projects. And if you kind of treat this as a project, that's going to be one of the things that you want to be aware of is how much is this going to cost me? Well, it's a very great question. And the answer is, it depends. So there is an actual cost for both filing a provisional um, patent as well as filing a utility patent. Now, what is that cost? What are those fees gonna be? That gets a bit tricky to answer because while the USPTO has a really great fee schedule on their page that tells you exactly what they charge, you would think it would be straightforward and you know to the point, this is exactly how much it's going to cost me. Well, that nah, can be true, but for even the small example, Something like a provisional pet, which really should be easy to secure. That is $300, unless you're doing a paper filing for some reason, or unless you're a small entity, which has its own definition, or unless you're a micro entity, which has its own definition. Now, when you look at non-provisionals, that actually gets very, very complicated with knowing how much it's going to cost you before you start going through this process. Because yes, on their fee schedule, they have a very specific price for what it costs to file a utility patent. But that's not really where the fees come into play. And that's not really where the money comes into play because costs can mount kind of quickly dependent on the examination of the, your patent. Now, 
there are things like searching fees, examination fees, response fees, correction fees, processing fees, appeal fees, petition fees, and on and on and on. Now, are you going to have to pay all of these fees every single time? Well, no. I mean, why would you need to appeal something if they just award you the patent? You probably want to factor in an appeal, though, um, at least, because it is very tough to get a patent awarded to you without the examiner coming back and having at least one niggling point where they go, no, you know, we're going to disallow this claim. You know, claims one through 20 are fine, but claims 21 through 24 are not allowed because of X, Y, and Z. Or, okay, well, we needed a response on this date. You responded late. We'll still take it, but there's an additional fee for that. So as long as you're on top of your game, as long as you put in all of the data, all the information, you do the groundwork, you do your due diligence very well, a lot of these fees disappear. Now, the more haphazard you put your application together, the more you may not have the science down, the more maybe demonstrable is kind of you know squishy for you. That's where those costs and those fees start to ratchet up. But those are just the fees that USPTO is going to put forward on your application that you're going to have to pay the USPTO. Because a lot of people, and we also run the NM Fast program, which helps small businesses go after SBIR and STTR opportunities. And people think of that as free money. And to a point, yeah, it's free money. But that's because they're forgetting to pay themselves. This is going to be a process. And typically, it's going to be a long tail process. You know, you can pay a patent lawyer to do a lot of this for you. But even if you go out there and you hire a patent lawyer, you're still going to have to have them in front or you're still going to have to give them information. You're going to have to give them data. So all of the time that you spent on that research, creating the filing, responding to office actions, things like that, you need to factor that in holistically when you're thinking about how do I protect this? And later on, when you think about how do I value this? Someone wants to buy this from me. Someone sees this as something that they want to acquire. How much do I know what it's worth? Well, when you look at that, you've got some really great market data out there, but you need to take into account all of the, let's call it R&D time it took you to get that patent in place. Because this really can be the true cost of a patent. It's on you and the onus of your business to do everything right, to make sure that costs don't mount up and you're not you know, putting more gold coins in Scrooge McDuck's coffers. Now, when you're thinking about that game plan, though, you need to think about kind of your own schedule. So the USPTO has their schedule. And you're going to ask, well, Del, I understand, you know, this seems like an onerous process. And it does work out. I'm here to tell you that right now. Don't lose hope and don't lose heart. But you're going to say, well, I want to file today. I have everything. And then that means I'm going to have my patent in, you know, three to four months, right? No, no. No, my sweet summer flower, you're not. Because the USPTO has their own time schedule they work off of. And a lot of this is squidgy and murky, but that's because it really just depends on exactly how long the prosecution schedule is. If you filed your application, you know, come Friday, it would probably be assigned to a prosecutor in about six months. And that's the time period that USPT is typically working on now. Now they're going to take a look at it. They're going to actually, you know, validate the claims. They're going to do some searching. They're going to say, is this conflicting? Is this, you know, potentially infringing on something else? And then you know, maybe they come back and you get an assignment of rights. And an assignment of rights is that patent board. Congratulations, you're an inventor in the eyes of the USPTO at that point. But 
that entire process from when that prosecutor first starts looking at it to when you've secured your patent could potentially take years. You know, at a bare minimum, probably gonna take six months, but it could be five, six years down the road that you've had to respond to, you know, appeals or you've had to make appeals or you've responded to, you know, what they call office actions where they say, hey, we're not allowing these claims. But when you're looking at that overall kind of goal though, know that once you have that assignment of rights, once you have that award, you also have to pay the maintenance of it. You're gonna have three maintenance periods over that 20 years. One at four years or technically three and a half, one at seven and a half or eight years, and then one at 11 and a half or 12 years. And just like maintenance sounds like, well, there's a maintenance fee. So a patent is only as valuable uh, to yourself and your business as what could potentially come out of it. When you're trying to put that thought exercise behind it, when you're trying to create that you know, pipeline for success for protecting your intellectual property, keep these aspects in mind. Is it going to make sense to you know, pay the maintenance fee on something at that 12 year mark that maybe you haven't tried to make a product out of? Or maybe you haven't tried to see if someone else wants to license it. Or maybe you haven't you know, sought out acquisition strategies. Really, again, it's only as valuable as what you can do with it and what can come out of it. Now, when you are working through that prosecution, though, a couple of things to keep in mind is really the prosecution is just the examiner coming back and saying, well, I don't agree with that. That's what they mean by prosecution. It's not Phoenix Wright and your yelling objection on a court stand. It's just them saying, hey, we don't understand this or we don't think you've got this right or there's this thing that shows somebody else has already done this in the past. You have to know that rationale and that's why it's so important to keep those meticulous notes is there's almost always a guarantee that your first time out of the gate you're not just gonna hit a grand slam, that they're going to find something wrong with it and they're gonna to wanna to argue with you about it. Now, with all of the horror stories out of the way, so why go through this process? It seems so difficult and so costly. What does that actually do for you? Well, it gives you really great position. You know, it gives you a definitive market advantage that, protects you for a certain amount of time. It allows you to uh, set up alternative um, streams of revenue for your company like licensing. It also even helps you foster a culture of innovation at your company, which helps you kind of continue to move forward, turn research into development, into products, and have that strategy of continuous growth and development. Now you can hear me talk about why should a business actually go through this entire process and what their steps are, or you can hear from somebody that has actually done this. So we have Brooke Montgomery on today that's gone through this process for her business. Brooke, can you describe what you sought, why you did it, and even the idea behind why am I going to protect this as my business? Thank you, Dale. Thank you everybody for having me here. Um, so I have um, filed four, actually now five patent applications um, over the course of the last six years and through my business Pivotal Biotech, which is a medical device business. And the reason that I first filed, well, there was, what Dell had said were the main reasons that I filed my patents. Um, my first uh, pr provisional patent was actually in 2015 when I came up with an idea that solved a problem regarding a medical device um, that's used in the ICU units of hospitals. And it's also used in home health care at times now too. Um, this device was a high, I'll let you know about it because I filed the patents, but the device at the hospital is a high flow therapy oxygen machine. Um, it's a machine, many of you have probably seen at some point in your life, um, that has these um, oxygen tanks and some other gases that connect to a tube, that connects to a cannula or a mask that delivers oxygen to a patient 
um, that's in respiratory distress, um, and it delivers that oxygen at a very high flow rate. So it's forcing air into that patient. Um, this, uh, my first patent or my first invention actually solved a problem with that machine. Um, it was, it had um, humidified air in the oxygen tube that uh, was condensating when it reached the adapter and cannula. And that condensation was actually accumulating to 70 cc's every 12 hours and forcing um, water up the patient's nares and their nostrils. So my device actually removed that condensated water in order to uh, reduce aspiration and reduce um, the patient from being uncomfortable. It's actually very uncomfortable. So when I came up with this, I came into Arrowhead Center and I wanted to learn about one, how I could make the first working prototype and two, how to protect the idea. Um, so I'd have a competitive advantage in the market. Um, so there were some other reasons actually that I filed more patent applications and those were that it helped me get um, grants. When I applied for different grants, I wanted to make sure that my idea was protected before I spoke about it. And similarly with pitch competitions, um, I've been in several pitch competition as my team has, and we want to feel comfortable talking about it without risking um, that we are giving up our secret um, and our novelty and that we would lose the opportunity to protect it. Uh, so co more comfortably, I could apply for grants and I could apply for different types of competitions. Some pitches with my pitch deck, some were like with the state EDD with, you know, their executive. Um, I think they had like a business plan or executive summary um, competition, and we wanted to be freely talk about these devices. So that were those were some of the main initial reasons why I filed my patent application for that filter and my other ones. Um, also, it allows me the opportunity to license my patent and um, to possibly be acquired as a business um, if some other medical device company wanted to do so. So the first one in my journey was a big learning experience. Um, many things that Dell said um, actually touched on what I went through. And um, so I will say that I filed a provisional patent that lasted 12 months. And I wanted to do that so I could two one speak about it and have a competitive advantage. And I was going to be in the uh, first Aggie Shark Tank. So I wanted to make sure that it was patented before I spoke in front of a lot of people about my idea. So I filed it. Um, it was not very much money at all that time. Um, I wrote it myself and I watched YouTube videos and I read manuals from the USPTO. Um, and so it wasn't the best, but it actually, you know, it wasn't too bad, but it definitely I learned a lot since then. Um, that being said, with your first one, some of you may have already filed patent applications. I would strongly after filing five, have you have a very, very good patent attorney. Um, but it, it was it was good enough um, to speak on, to be honest. So if you don't have the money for a patent attorney, it at that time cost me sixty five dollars, as Dell had said that range that pay could uh that price fee could um change because um you could be a micro entity or you could be you know there's just so many different things um it was 65 dollars as a micro entity in 2015 for me i believe now a non or a provisional patent is probably 75 dollars i haven't looked at the uspto um, page in a while so 65 bucks so i could talk about it i think it was worth it looking back i wish i had a lot of money because um i would have had a much better strategically planned patent that i would have filed so in a year from then, um, 2016, I had to, before the filing date, file a non-provisional utility you know, patent um, because my deadline was coming up and I did get an attorney to do that. So we converted my, my uh, provisional patent to a non-provisional. That cost me roughly $3,500. Um, I actually knocked off a couple thousand because I had CAD drawings that were done at um, Studio G and Arrowhead Center at the time. Um, now we can do that with AIS and um, Aggie Innovation Space. But uh, back then in 2016, I submitted those drawings and it saved me $2,000. And I spent $3,500, which I got through um, some grants. So fortunately, I was able to keep my personal cost down. I also um, ended up registering uh, my LLC because I wanted to si assign my patent to my business. And the reason that I did that was because it 
um, provided a distance between me and any liability with my medical devices. Um, and I wanted to file more patents and I uh, talked to some patent attorneys and business attorneys and they advised me to assign the patent to my business. So I, I formed my business. Um, I am listed as an inventor on um, all of them and the only inventor on the first few. So there are some documents that lawyer, lawyers can help you with, patent attorneys, but um, when you're listed as an inventor, there's options to take partial percentage or fully give it to the business. I fully have all my patents assigned to my business, so my business owns them. Um, and so I think that was a good thing for me. Um, you guys all can talk to your business attorney and patent attorneys for advice on that. I'm not an attorney, but um, I do in, think in my particular situation and with the type of medical devices I had um, that it was good for me to assign my patents to the business. Um, I participated to get to my next patent application. I actually participated in Aggie i -Corps, an NSF funded um, i -Corps project through NMSU and Arrowhead Center and Studio G. And at that time I did um, 36 or so customer discovery interviews to see if um, just to talk to the potential customers and identify what their pains and gains were. And in that process, I did come up with a um, continuation in parts, a CIP patent um, that was for my model two. Um, so I designed a second model that actually worked much more efficiently and had a better product market fit. Um, doing it through my customer discovery, I found that the next model was something that they would really want. They did want my other one, but the next one was you know, better. So I filed my next patent application. Um, it was also a provisional patent for 12 months. Um, I then started working on it in the lab, um, testing it out so that when I would file my non-provisional in a year, I knew that I really had um, everything down. So I did have a patent attorney I was very grateful for, and he was able to teach me a little bit more about strategizing um, when writing the first non-provisional and I'm sorry, provisional and non-provisional CIP. Um, some things that I learned about strategizing on patents, um, learned quite a bit, is um, to think about the future, um, think 20 years ahead, think about what might be changing um, in both the industry that you're in, so like for my medical device, what could evolve, um, where are things going, which interestingly, mine was respiratory care, so COVID-19. Um, came along and I have filed another patent since then. So thinking like, what if there's another, you know, virus or what could have helped with my medical device during this time of a pandemic. So that got me thinking about future things that could happen. And so you want to think about future for your device or your industry. Um, the other strategy that I found helpful that I was taught by my patent attorneys was that um, to think about other industries. So even though mine is a respiratory device, um, I actually thought about what other industries this could work in, and I'll get into that with the um, next patent. But I will just, and I'll go back to that first patent that I filed in 2015 application. Um, then I did a CIP in 2016. It took two years and nine months to get to the examiner. From what I was told was, it depends on like the type of um, device and um, or you know application and that is assigned to specific examiners um, in different departments. Some specialize on these types of medical devices. It helps them know how to give you a hard time. So um, so my examiner um, came back two years and nine months later, and my patent attorney was ready to. I feel like like what Dell said. I felt like it was a prosecution, but it's you know it's an office response is what it's called. Um, there's an office action, and I had to respond to what I mean. And that response is almost like defending it. I didn't go through that process because when I was talking to my lawyer, it was going to cost money of uh, probably another three to four thousand um, dollars for my memory. And I um, had covered everything in the model one in my continuation and parts model two that I filed in 2017. So everything was already covered in my second patent. So I had to decide as a CEO of my business, did I want to spend more and more money on my first provisional patent application that I filed myself um, when I have it in another one. So there's some benefits for me doing either, okay? I could have responded and got it and spent a lot of, you know, spent probably in the end $9,000. Um, and then I have a kind of more of a portfolio of patents to my business. So that's a plus. 
on the negative, I'm spending $9,000 on something that I'm going to end up probably actually selling the second model of by the time that one comes, it'll be the next year because I filed them a year apart and I would be paying $9,000 again. And that would have been $18,000. So personally, and everybody's different. I chose to abandon the first application and to um, get the second one issued, which it did get issued by the USPTO. So the next year, so two years and nine months after my CIP, it got to the examiner um, and I did um, respond once. So Wendell said, keep in mind some fees for your appeal, uh, for your office actions and all that. Um, I haven't met too many people that didn't have to respond to the examiner and there are fees for that and patent attorney fees unless you do it on your own. Um, so keep that in mind about grants, about different ways that you can have be prepared for whatever time frame it might be a couple of years later or whatever it is um, to do your office action response. So um, I got a really good attorney. I switched attorneys. I had a good one before, but well, some people might know my attorneys. Um, I did end up getting an attorney in Stanford who got his PhD in mechanical engineering at MIT. Um, the reason that I decided to spend a little bit more, well, actually, it was probably similar in money because I, I knew him a little bit. I'd met him as an acquaintance and through my networking. So I don't think he like charged me as much as some other people, but the reason that I did pay for him to do it was because he had this really good skill set of one, being able to write patents and patentees, um, and also be able to understand strategically how to um, state the claims and, and all that in writing, but he also to call up the examiner and talk with her and explain it. And not all patent attorneys can do that. So um, some are just more like focused on writing the patents and doing that legal um, jargon. And they're very, very smart and very valuable. And some can talk to an examiner. So if you get into a place where you feel like your patent examiner needs to be talked to <laughs> or not that you would benefit from somebody ha having a conversation with them, then you know reach out and ask if the patent attorney feels comfortable and if they've ever done that before i switched and went to one who had um because i wanted him to explain it um and so i went through a second office action response so i actually went through one got through that one she actually i had a, a, a lady that was pretty helpful in her office response so she told me she was going to look into some other things while i was um in my feelings of defending it, I was reading a lot of prior art and explaining why mine was novel and why it wasn't obvious to someone knowledgeable in the art. And just my patent attorney wrote it really well and could talk to her. She said she was going to come back with some other questions about the valves. And so I knew that was coming. So that was my second one, another fee, <laughs> just so you know. Um, and then she issued it. So, so I was very happy to get my patent. Um, now I can have a plaque and um, sell it. And so a couple other things that that helps with. Um, when I abandoned my first provisional patent, which is included in my CIP, um, a very lucrative medical device business um, that makes and nets like $2.7 billion, it's a worldwide business, they, um, they filed an application that looked just about exactly like my first one. Um, the drawings, if I showed them to you, they look exactly, they look very, very similar. Um, so once my patent was issued, I could approach them and ask them to um, provide me with royalties or my patent attorney could then say, hey, that borders or is or is not whatever infringement on my um, CIP. So I could not do that before my patent was issued. Um, so that's one thing. The other option that I had is my patent attorney could let their examiner know, um, be aware of my two applications because they were published, so they're not secret. And that person would have a really hard time patenting their application if it looks uh, as similar as it did. So they could go, my patent attorney said he could do that, um, but that might put them on the, you know, not be happy with me place. And so we didn't do that. I chose to actually um, contact them and said, and see if they'd like to um, sell that patent, but license it and provide me with royalties. So that's um, just something to keep in mind if somebody copies your patent, um, which these big businesses may do because, um, you know, they got a lot of money and a lot of lawyers. So the next patent that I did, so I went through that in 2020, um, sorry, the defense or not defense, but office action response of my one that was issued. 
and then you get a certain amount of time to pay the issue fee. <laughs> so there's more money. And um, that wasn't too bad. I think it was like 350 bucks. But then um, before I filed my issue fee to get my patent, I had an opportunity. I'm not a patent attorney, so you can talk to yours. But my patent attorney told me that I could file another model, CIP, on it. And that leverages the patent that was issued that was deemed novel by the examiner. Um, giving me an advantage on my next patent rather than just filing another patent afterwards i'm leveraging it as a continuation of part for my next model. Um, I came up with my next model during the pandemic. Um, I realized that there are some things that I could do in terms of biosensors to test the viruses um, and um, check biosensors for respiratory rate and some other factors and metrics from um, the patient, I also got a student team because um, we were very busy during that time so. I had two students from UTEP and one from UC Berkeley. The two mechanical engineering from students from UTEP came up with a novel idea to um, have the biosensors also regulate the temperature of the um, of my device that removed the water. Sorry, I didn't tell you what the second version was. It also delivers medication through it now. That was the second one. Um, so that was the first CIP, but second patent application. So this one actually um, allows it controls the heat so that it's comfortable for the patient and reduces it from reaching dew point or condensating. So there's no condensation at all going to be um, occurring. And I also had a student from UC Berkeley who developed the machine learning algorithm, which, like Dell said, it's not easy to patent software, um, but you can patent the device that the software component was actually like a concept map um, rather than just patenting the algorithm within the device itself um, patent. So it's a component of that. Um, I did not file a provisional patent. I filed a non-provisional because we'd already, the students had already tested it um, and went through it enough to feel comfortable to file a non-provisional patent for that. I filed that last month um, or two months ago, something like that. And so that one um, hopefully will also be issued. And now um, I'll have a bit of a small portfolio of patents. Some advice I have on um, writing a patent that can help you. So sometimes businesses want more patents. They'll every little thing they'll file a CIP with because um, maybe they have more money. But with me, I wanted to have a really strong patents um, and pay the money for the real strong ones. So I use the words may. <laughs> These are just very helpful little tips. Um, alternatively and optionally. So if I wanted it to have the circuit on. There was a button maybe you'll use the circuit maybe you won't it's an option so i was covering in the claim yes the circuit yes the biosensor or no just use it without um so may alternately even optionally were used quite a bit in my claims for my um this most recent one and actually may was used quite a bit in my last one as well um let's see so so those are decisions that you can make as a business again based on how much money you want to spend on the patents. Um, some do patent every little thing, a new CIP, and I chose to pack it all in to, um, to save me money. And let's see, um, I think that's all of the bullet points that I had, Dell. Oh, I guess there was one last little thing I put at the very end. Don't talk about it. Um, if you do, talk very generally or not at all, keep it secret. So, you know, people ask you, you can say it has to do with the oxygen machine. I didn't even use the words high flow therapy until my patents were filed. So just don't don't talk about it, don't publish it, don't do a pitch deck on it, just keep it to yourself until you file your application. Thank you guys. Oh, thank you again, Brooke. And just to um, follow up on one of the things you said is that's actually a really great strategy when people are looking at making their claims is, be very liberal about your uses of may, potentially, alternatively. You want to make sure that your claims are as broad as they can be, because again, you know, your claims are what limit what your patent focuses on. And that's what limits what you're actually protecting. Um, there's some really great strategies about that. And in our second session, um, next time, we're actually going to have a former, um, again, USPTO examiner talk about that and also 
one of the things that Brooke brought up, talk about the value of having a patent attorney that will actually talk to the examiner, that will have that conversation. That can be extremely beneficial rather than fighting an uphill battle of sending back and forth chains of emails and paying appeal fees um, until, you know, essentially you get a final action, which final action really means now we, we're done arguing about this with you. You never really want to go through that because um, then your back's up against the wall. Real quick, um, one of the things that we often hear about, particularly in the light of the SBIR and STTR programs, is when do I file this? You know, do I need this um, going forward? And I wanted to bring this up because it actually touches on a few of the things we've talked about. You know, when you're looking at that phase one funding, it's about establishing the feasibility of the idea. Um, you don't need a provisional patent before you do that. That should sound really familiar. What are you doing once you get your provisional patent? What are you trying to establish before you move on to that non-provisional? Huh, well, those seem to line up pretty well. And you know, do you need a patent in place to go after that phase two? Well, no, because that phase two shows how it works and how you can make it work, make it work every time for a product. Weird, that, that sounds very familiar too. So when you're looking at those opportunities, those funding opportunities, grants, you know, contracts, things like that, how can you leverage funding? Just keep in mind that that entire innovation cycle really does map towards those intellectual pro uh, protections, um, our intellectual property protections, and you can leverage that strategy very well when you're looking at those opportunities. You know, as Brooke said, one of the big things to know is that really you kind of want to have some good basis, some good grounding before you even think about optioning on your plan. You want to know that you're not going to struggle, that you've removed a lot of the risks and hurdles that you could potentially have. So now I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, when I send um, everybody the follow-up email after this, I'll actually give you a link. We have the um, sign-up page up for our next session, um, our July 26 one. It'll be from 2 to 3 p.m. It'll be virtual. And again, we're going to dive in depth into what is actually required for your applications for these different types of patents. But in the meantime, if anybody has a question for myself or Brooke, Feel free to fire away. Hi, Dell. Uh, this is Boris speaking. Uh, can I squeeze in a you know question? Uh, hopefully, you know uh, the other participants that uh, you know uh, don't have any any questions uh, already posed. Sure, go ahead, Boris. Yeah, you know, uh, Dell. Thanks, so, you know, for a great presentation, Brooke. You know, thank you for for sharing um, your personal experience. You mentioned that you you know that you worked with at least two um, uh, uh, attorneys. Um, yeah, you know, so multiple attorneys. Could you speak to how you how you went about evaluating, you know, with whom to work with? So you how did you go about choosing? That? And I realize instinctively, I would think word of mouth recommendations. You mentioned um, the the credentials and, and academic qualifications of one. I believe you mentioned and you. Know, uh, MIT and, and Berkeley, obviously outstanding uh, academic institutions, and and, and I, I really you know, it's 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 clearly difficult to evaluate and assess you know professional sort the quality of professional services. How did you go about you know um, you know obviously finding the right the right partner ultimately? Um, I think um, there was initially I didn't have as much experience with the patent process, so my evaluation was really um, based on like education experience, I asked questions like, you know, have you ever uh, patent medical devices like this? Or um, have you ever licensed or negotiated? So some of them had patent things in the similar field, but had never licensed or negotiated. So you could kind of get a, like a feel for their experience. Um, so I knew like, well, I'll just say like my first one had never done a license. 
but he did do a fairly good job with, I mean, he did a good job. He was, I could see a difference with my second one. It was better, um, but he did do a good job with writing it, but he had not, um, he was not as experienced to communicate. So to negotiate licenses, to help me with license paperwork. And he was also not as familiar with talking to people, um, examiners at USPTO. He was easily able to tell me who my examiner was, you know, and look up that information. Um, the other weird thing was like, well, I don't know, it was kind of weird, but some patent attorneys didn't get back to me when I first first reached out. And when I got to this one, um, he was very quick to get back to me. So I think either they're just booked and they're sometimes honest about it. Like they're in the middle of defending a patent in their in court and they don't have time. Um, so I did ask this both, um, do they have paralegals? How many paralegals? How big is your office? Because then you know that if something happens, they're going to get to you right away because time is of the essence when it comes to patenting. Um, I wanted to make sure I was first to file. And so if somebody wasn't getting back to me, um, so, and that did happen. They just were slow to email back, slow to call me, and they were just off my list. Um, but word of mouth came, it was through networking where I got the one that I have now that filed, um, in a sense, defended my office action responses and filed my last one, the one from um, Stanford and went to MIT was through just now I've just been around more, talked to people, did workshops like this one and got people's emails. And they said, this is one that's good and also is able to talk to the examiner. And that's really what I needed was someone who could help me and um, persuade some like get that information across the examiner because I would not want like Dell said a final action of it not being issued you know after all that time and effort so I knew I needed someone who could really convey that and some patent attorneys can't so if you feel like hey I'm doing I'm about to have an office action response I got an office action and I want someone who can really convey this I don't feel guilty for switching patent attorneys because it got done um, and people like know which patent attorneys can do it. They just told me like he can he can do it and he can call up an examiner. He feels very comfortable with it and he will help you get this issued. So it was at the end word of mouth that got me to that one. He's very good. Um, every time I talk to one, I could just learning. You talk to so many patent attorneys. If you call them up, you'll see like, they'll talk about things like strategizing, um, the industry thing. Nobody else had brought that up with me. My last patent, I looked at the Fortune 500 top industries and said, how would my medical device work in like, you know, um, like, I don't know, new types of vehicles. Like it's a biosensor that's going to know how the person is while they're in a Thomas. I don't know. I just like made stuff up just, you know, but um, and then there was so there were some other ones like dietitian, nutrition, sports, all of the biosensors could work with that one too. So I put alternatively, alternatively, and this last patent attorney was the only one that mentioned that to me. So he was, he was very helpful with strategizing and kind of reiterating Dell again, references. Um, I referenced inside the patent prior art beforehand so that I would not have to go through the office action response I did last time. I referenced everything, why mine was different and novel. So I knew whatever might be some like the slope of this thing in the filter, I found them all and that patent attorney was able to reference like a ton of patents. Hopefully when I get to the office action, I won't have to defend as much because that was prepared ahead of time strategically. So if you find a patent attorney who's like, I'm fine, they're doing great prior art searches and they're referencing 25 people, um, you know that's good because you don't have to defend it later. And honestly, if you got later, if that company came back and said, you copied me, it's already in your patent that was issued, right? Like, no, I wasn't. See, I said how it was different in my patent. So it protects you in the future from being sued for infringement. So I just learned, but you know, I just learned like they brought up that, they brought up the other industries, you know, it just, um, and then they were able to talk to people and I just talked to other patent attorneys until I found the right one. Thanks, thanks. I hope that answers it. <laughs> as, you know, as we, so if I was to kind of like summarize what you said and, and, and um, in the abstract, clearly your your attorney benefited from having a you know very informed and educated you know client. So I mean, obviously you, you clearly you know my work's not yours, but you supported the work of your attorney. But you know with respect to the research that you previously had done, um, and then uh, you know so clearly you found a, a, an attorney that you know who you know whose experience was clearly relevant and on point with regards to the specific in this case the medical device um, and and the nature of of uh, 
you know, um, of, of the application, you know, and having the experience, not just in, I suppose, drafting, but also in, in, in the communication that you mentioned um, with the, the patent examiner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good if you have an examiner who's available to you and they appreciate feedback from the inventor. Um, the other thing too is they'll let you know if something doesn't, something kind of seems obvious, so you rethink it. Like it looks like that could look obvious to someone knowledgeable in the art. He like it if they're really good, they'll say that to you. Like, you know, um, you know, some you know, just you know, if, if you could like elaborate on a point that you know that I missed, you know, or at least I didn't quite grasp during during, during your talk, your presentation. You mentioned that you abandoned a provisional um, application, and you know, so um, in, in in you know, I, I um, you know. It, you know, did did the patent examiner you know, inform you or or advise you with you know, with regard to that decision? Did that you know? And so I guess from my standpoint is, how did the how did the patent examiner provide you with the ability to assess the probabilities? That's it. You know, the probabilities of pursuing a particular path as opposed to another path because it, it's clearly very probabilistic. Obviously, there it, it's not certain. Um, and even the timelines, uh, you know, you know, can vary. So, you know, um, can you speak to that? Yeah. Um, so, my that was my first patent attorney when I made that decision, and he was very good at taking the time to tell me um, my options. So, I had already I had a provisional patent. I had converted to a non-provisional a year later, and then I had been doing research in the lab and made my next model and did Aggie Icor with the commercial, you know, find out what would be good for a product market fit. In that I made another application for a continuation in part, so a CIP. And that CIP included the whole first patent. So what happened was when it got to the examiner, he said, my patent attorney talked to me for about, I would say about an hour. He told me how he would defend it. Okay, so how he would, I mean, you know, but if there was like an office, office action, how he would defend it. Um, and I liked what he said. I think he could have gotten it issued possibly. Um, but then he said, then you're going all through that and you're paying me all this money, but you've got this continuation in part that is inclusive of the whole first one. And we include the whole thing in it. So he was like, then you're going to double pay me again next year. So it wasn't an easy decision. Um, you know, as a CEO, it's like, because I knew I could have a small portfolio of patents and this would add up to it so it could make me seem more like lucrative with my number of patents. But at the same time, um, it was kind of a waste of money. <laughs> it, besides that, it was just it was just to have another patent because it was included in my other one. So after that, we talked for about an hour. I gave it a week or so, and then I let him know that I was going to abandon it. Now, there is a six, there is a not a six month, three month period for it being late and you can still save it. So he noted on his calendar and reached back to me before that three months. And I, um, in writing, let him know that I was gonna abandon that that first patent application. You know, thanks again for uh, for adding color to that kind of cost benefit analysis and, and ultimately the decision that you made. Right, thanks. And kind of just as a uh, follow-up to Boris, you know, one of the things um, Brooke mentioned when she was looking at the different uh, patent attorneys and which one she wanted to go with. You know, she had the really great idea there. You ask a lot of questions, you find out about their history, you find out what they've done. But on the USPTO site, you can actually do a search through the application database and you can search for a law firm. There's a field for attorney or agent and you can put in the law firm or even the individual um, patent attorney that you're potentially talking to and just see how many applications have they submitted, how many actually went through and how many did they leverage into a full patent. That's a really great way just to see, okay, this person says that they've done this, let me double check this. And if they said, well, I've put in over a thousand patent applications and you see that the database says 50, there's a discrepancy there. So just, you know, gather that data, gather that information and, you know, just figure out almost that kind of basic customer discovery is go out there, ask questions and ask them of your potential, you know, patent attorney. Thank you. Know, th thanks, y'all. You know, Adele, I, I, you know, um, I appreciate that, 
you know, that, that, that value add. And, I, you know, so as I was listening to you, I, I you know, I thought, so, you know, you know, again, forgive me for monopolizing, but a third question, you know, uh, and then, you know, passing it back to, to, to Brooke um, about, you, 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 you emphasize under, understandably that the importance of, um, of secrecy, in my words, again, you know, of, you know, not, not speaking, you know, you know, in depth about, you know, a pending, you know, uh, application for understandable reasons. And you also mentioned like participating in, you, 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 you mentioned pitching. So I, I imagine, you know, if I heard you correctly, you participated in, uh, you, uh, in an incubator program or something along those lines is, is kind of like you know, the idea that I got when, you know, um, as I kind of, you know, just uh, gather my thoughts to, you know, frame my question. You, you spoke about the IP assignment. So, you know, you're choosing an entity, I believe you mentioned an LLC, you know, the IP assignment, and you're obviously the owner. Did, did you, did you deal with, did you work with any um, angel investors or, or VCs, or did you bootstrap this, uh, this, you know, this, and I ask not, to, you know, I, I asked from, from this standpoint, I, you know, if, if you did work with, you know, um, with outside investors, what questions did they have? With regards to the IP and the IP protection, and how you know how uh, open did you know did you discuss your the, the pending patent application matter? Um, so I did pitch, and I was I did a couple a couple pitches, and I've done some not in person pitch, like sending in um, for grant funding. I did receive various grants. Um, I would call it more like bootstrapping um, everything most of what I said all those most of those numbers were paid through through grants so even the patent fees except for the very end this last year um, so I was offered um, money from angel investors and I didn't take it because I I was getting grants and I felt like if I could continue to keep to have non-diluted funds um, if I were to sell the license to this or do whatever, I don't have to, you know, share that. Um, so I was asked not as many questions, honestly, about the patent and its protection. They just wanted to verify that it was protected. The angel investors never asked me details of the patent. They wanted to know about the commercial market, about the scalability and any traction that I had. Those were the main, the main questions. Um, they wanted to know like how long it would take to get FDA tested, um, which, really doesn't take long with my device just so you know it's a class two um so they asked about that because they just want to know could it get on the market and what tractions did i have to bring in revenue and interestingly did not ask much except for verifying that i had the patent um so i didn't do that um i will add another thing that you made me think of real quick was i do have several inventors in last one two students that are mechanical engineering students at utep and one um at uc berkeley and they are listed as inventors if you do have a team, make sure you talk up front about the expectations of if they have ownership or not. Um, everything went well with me. I've had various team members come and we're very clear. We put everything in writing. I just encourage that you do that. Um, the pat your patent attorney will have documents, um, forms for you know inventor disclosure forms, um, as I believe what they're called. And on those, I think I mentioned earlier, there's like percent of ownership and no one got ownership so the vet, the students were clear that they are listed as inventors but the ownership is 100 percent written on the documents to pivotal biotech um so just to give you that piece of information if you do bring on a team member um discuss it up front if they're fine just being listed as an inventor then you can have the proper paperwork completed and signed and submitted to the uspto so that they are listed only as an inventor but they are not um, getting any ownership of any revenue that comes in from it. And just to jump in, because I saw that one of our uh, other um, attendees has a uh, question, but to kind of follow up along with um, Brooke, what uh, Brooke was talking about for us, if you're looking at that potential, you know, outside investment and making it part of your overall patent and protection strategy, also just know that at that stage, you're going to introduce a lot of risk into the deal too, um, because you haven't gone through it. You haven't even put in maybe the provisional or 
you haven't you know, ascertained the claims and you don't have all the technical data, the more potential risk that comes to the table when you're looking at that angel investment or venture capital or anything like that, just to be perfectly blunt, the overall worse your terms are gonna be. So if you can get away from having outside investment be part of your patent strategy, I would definitely do that because it's gonna put you in a much better position when you look at that third party investment, be it angel, be it venture capital, whatever type of dilutive um, funding you're looking at, you're gonna get much better terms and it's gonna put you in a much better bargaining position when you come to the request and you come to the table. You know, absolutely great point. I mean, I'm, I'm nodding my head absolutely with regards to like, you know, any dilutive, you know, uh, the funding that, you know, any dilutive funding that, that Brooke, you know, spoke about in her case. Brooke, one last very quick question. In your experience with working with patent attorneys, you, you mentioned, the, you know, the cost was understandably, uh, a, you know, uh, one factor in, 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 in your earliest decisions. And you are, you know, and I, you know, are, do, and this is a silly question, so forgive the naivete, but you know, we you know would you know did you you know do do patent attorneys work on would, would they accept equity in, in in exchange for for their work, uh, you know uh, in drafting and you know in, you know in 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 in, in the application. Um, I have had um, a couple of patent attorneys um, offer equity into a draft. So if they felt that this was a sure sell. Um, they did not want money up front. For example, if I got my last one, which I just got issued, um, issued, the other company that's essentially copied it um, makes it more, that's one factor that they would take into account that they might get some money on it um, and they might be able to sell it because they have someone interested in it, right? Because they copied it. Um, the other things are like, I've done now close to a hundred customer discovery interviews and I can show that as data on in terms of commercial market and a need to bring in revenue. And so um, I have had, um, I think a couple say that they would take equity on negotiating the license. I'm not, not necessarily on writing the patent, but negotiating the license. And writing the license and doing all the legal stuff, but I could probably negotiate or do most of that, but then they would file for the license. But, you know, th thanks again. I apologize for not monopolizing the uh, the, the Q and A time. You know, Brooke, thanks, and 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 also, you know, congrats, you know, for for maintaining or for for not diluting your ownership, you know, interest when you know the counterfactual maybe a, another inventor entrepreneur may have accepted, you know, outside financing. Hi, this is Ricky Wiltshire. Um. Sorry to dump in here, but it's 11 p.m. here in Berlin, and um, you know, I kind of want to get to bed and ask my question. Oh, um, go ahead. I mean, the other guy can continue after this, but um, you know, uh, I want to ask it. I just want to mention a couple things. Um, from the European point of view, I'm an American, by the way, and I um, I lived and worked in Washington D.C., close to the uh, patent office, and I lost a couple of good employees to the patent office who are excellent engineers on my team. So their quality employees are there at the PTO office. Uh, second of all. Um, Europe has a um, kind of a clearinghouse for all of Europe. I want to mention that um, instead of you can just go to the European Patent Office if you want to file your claim here in Europe instead of going to in the individual countries. The European Patent Office then has a system that you know delegates this down to individual countries um, review offices, um, and so I think each country. Issues a rev uh, does the review and issues are penned. So the European Pen and Trade Office is a very good resource, just like the USPTO, and you know getting your claims here in Europe. Which I suggest. I don't know if you have any worked with that yet or not, but I think it's a good idea. And I think Asia has one as well. But I think mean, you know it's just a good idea. And and they do use a lot of similar things with the USPTO. It's just a little little different system here. Um, but it's good to uh, good to know. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank oh, you. Thanks for that uh, knowledge point there. Um, personally, I did have um, both my patent attorneys spoke to me about both Asia and Europe. Um, and I was told that I had up to one year after my patent application to decide to go that route. I don't know. Dell might have better information on it. 
um, because I didn't go that route because uh, I looked up the statistics of what my device was being used in different countries and it's very expensive to continue expanding. Um, but this last one that I just filed, I may do international patents and um, and sell them in different countries. For the last one, I didn't end up filing that fee and doing that. But they brought it up with me, Dell might be better explaining it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I don't have, um guidance on what that timeline would look like. Um, one thing that I can definitely say though is, you know, when you are looking at those international markets for filing, um, a good piece of awareness is, again, you know, a patent gives you rights and it gives you abilities, but it doesn't set stuff in stone. If someone infringes upon it, it's not just a oh, well, they owe you $14 million. You have to go through, you know, some judicial review. So when you are looking at filing in other countries, whether it's a, you know, common collective like, you know, Europe or Asia, or whether it's individualistic countries, that if you're going to prosecute those, typically it's just like any other contract where you would actually go to that country to prosecute it and where that um, originator is. Um, so one of the things just to keep in mind when you're looking at that strategy that also depends on as uh, the, and which country it is um for example i know i live in germany and if there's a if there's a, if there's a, a infringement case you can um sue them in, in u.s court and have the judgment be applied to um be enforced in germany just the other way around like you can, for, you can have a german enforcement in the united states there's a couple countries germany's one france is one i know that um, well, they have that agreement already in place. Makes sure. it a little bit easier. Yeah. But other countries, I don't know. Yeah. And that would just be kind of factor into that overall strategy is when you're looking at how useful what you're creating would be in other countries and, you know, going after that, I would definitely make that part of your at least planning process to see what the litigation process would be for those countries. And you know, ultimately plan around that. Nobody wants to sue anybody, um, but it might be something you will have to do at one date in the future. So just, you know, what your options are and know what you have to plan for. Alrighty. Well, if there are no further questions, you know, thank you everybody again for tuning in to our first uh, webinar here. You know, thank you again, Brooke, for coming in, you know, giving your views and giving your story as a business. I thought that was a uh, very important, at least for this first one, that kind of focused on that business side um, methodology and, you know, just potentials of why you would protect your idea. And this session uh, was recorded. I will make sure that that recording goes up probably later on today for people. And I will send that just to the attendees. And I will also send information about the second in our series, which again will be July 26, and it will be looking at that actual process for different types of patents and what you need to do. But thank you all and everyone, enjoy the rest of your days.